On the night of the 24th of August, 2001, a fully loaded Airbus A330 with 306 people on board ran out of fuel midway over the Atlantic. How could a state-of-the-art computerized airliner suffer such a catastrophic failure? Mayday, mayday, mayday. We have lost both engines due to fuel starvation. We are gliding now. Well, we're now at 30,000 feet at the rate of descent of 2,000 feet per minute. We have to ditch in the water. And you didn't put on your life jackets right now? Oh, this film investigates what happened to Air Transat Flight 236. This is it. This is all. It's over. They're just going to die in the next five to ten minutes. And the speed's increasing. 203 knots now. It's way too fast. Hello, everybody, I need you to brace. Oh, my God! August 23, 2001, Toronto's International Airport is busy. Air Transat is a charter company that has grown rapidly to become one of the largest airlines in Canada. Midsummer brings fewer business travelers and a holiday atmosphere. Air Transat Flight 236 is bound for Lisbon. Most of the passengers are Canadians visiting Europe or Portuguese immigrants heading home. The plane, a twin-engined Airbus A330, is being flown by a young co-pilot, Dirk de Jager, and an experienced captain, Robert Pichet. Captain Robert Pichet is somewhat out of the ordinary. Captain Pichet, from the moment he gets his wing, he gets to learn how to fly in the uh, north of uh, the province of Quebec, where the conditions occasionally are very severe. The flight deck of the A330 is ultra-modern. Banks of computers connected to over 100 onboard sensors constantly monitor the operation of the plane. This film reveals how serious problems can arise when the pilots get unusual readings from the computers and begin to distrust them. On this night, the computers assist the smooth takeoff of Flight 236. 236 Heavy, follow A320 Air Canada. Turn left on Romeo and hold short on 24 right. Roger, follow A320 Air Canada, left on Romeo and hold short of 24 right. With the crew of 13, Flight 236 has 306 people on board. Four zero at eight, cleared for takeoff. Two four right, Transat two thirty six heavy. At ten minutes past eight, the Airbus A three thirty, loaded with over forty seven tons of fuel, left Toronto for Lisbon. V one, rotate. The weather forecast for the Atlantic crossing is good. Everything runs smoothly on the flight deck, apart from a small adjustment to the route. To avoid congestion, air traffic control directs the flight 60 miles south of its original route. It's a minor alteration, but will play a crucial role later. Passengers settle down for the long crossing. Everything appeared quite normal, and in fact, um, I had traveled on Air Transat previously and found it not to be very good, and was surprised by the quality of the flight, that you know, it was on time, the plane was newer, and we thought generally it was much better than we had expected it would be. We're getting to our next checkpoint. Every 30 minutes across the Atlantic, the crew check their position and fuel consumption against their flight plan. 0.2 tons on the right. 
11.2 tons on the left. Despite the computerized systems, some procedures like checking the fuel on board still need to be done by hand. Tons. By comparing the amount of fuel in the tanks with the amount the flight started with, the pilots can keep an eye on their fuel consumption. Fuel check complete. Level's normal for the distance flown. All right. For the first five hours, everything is routine. The flight crew, Air Transat, and accident investigators have all declined to be interviewed about what happened next. This film uses known facts about the flight standard emergency procedures and expert opinion to reconstruct what took place on flight 236. Look, we're getting a warning signal. Oil temp low and oil pressure high on number two. This warning is the first step in the crisis. Oil pressure is within the normal limits on number one. Number two is slightly high. The computer display reveals that the oil temperature is low in engine number two, but the oil pressure is high. It is a very unusual reading. The pilots are puzzled. I can't see anything here. Huh. I'll look in the FCOM. Okay. A low oil temperature indication is normally in indicative of, of bad readings, bad sensor. Uh, oil temperatures don't decrease normally, they increase. A low oil temperature would, would be of no concern. The high oil pressure is, uh, is a very strange indication. Uh, it's, it's very rare. In fact, I've never actually heard of one. It's only indicative of the contamination normally of the oil with fuel. Uh, that's not something that's explained in the manuals. Call the company. The crew contact Air Transat's maintenance group in Montreal. Transat 236 to Mirabel Operations. Mirabel Transat 236. Hi. Hi, we have a little problem. We're getting the warning oil temp low and oil pressure high on the ECAM for engine number two. There's nothing in the QRH nor the FCOM. Can you help us out? I'm looking in the manual. The ground crew have no immediate solution. The pilots must work it out themselves. They may have been given some advice uh, on, on troubleshooting uh, to see um, if that would help. But ultimately, uh, you know, the pilots are up there on their own. Uh, you know, they can get advice from somebody 2,500 miles away, but they can't really fix their problems. Suggest you keep monitoring your oil levels and see what happens. Advise us on but because the oil readings are so unusual, the pilots believe they may indicate a computer error. The crew keep monitoring the oil levels. Air Transat 236 continues on track. Then, 20 minutes later, a new warning. Fuel imbalance warning. Haven't seen that before. Follow all we can action. I have air traffic control. In the Airbus 330, most of the fuel is in large tanks in the wings. The computer has now detected that the fuel level on the right is now significantly lower than the left. The crew consults the Airbus flight manual, which recommends they transfer fuel through the special cross-feed valve. Fuel will then flow from one tank to the other. But before opening the cross-feed, the pilots must be sure that the imbalance is not caused by a more serious problem, such as a fuel leak. Last fuel check was only 15 minutes ago and it was okay. No indication of a fuel leak. Keep going. Wing cross-feed, on. On. Once you begin the cross-feeding procedure to correct a fuel imbalance, uh, restorative action should commence quite quickly. Uh, in other words, the situation would not continue to, uh, to get worse. It would, it would either stabilize immediately and then begin to, to correct itself. But the situation is not correcting itself. Unknown to the pilots, there is a major fuel leak in the number two engine on the right-hand side of the plane. Flight 
236 is some 300 kilometers from the nearest land in mid-Atlantic. 39,000 feet over the Atlantic, some 300 kilometers from land, Air Transat Flight 236 is in trouble. Unknown to the pilots, the right engine is leaking fuel. The plane's computer system has thrown up a series of warnings, but the pilots believe these are computer errors. Have you ever seen something like this before? No. Never. Doesn't make any sense. Hey, even if there is a leak, it doesn't explain the alarms on the oil system. And everything was okay at the last few check at 30 West. Oh, bet you it's a computer problem. The task of finding out if there is a fuel leak is made harder by the design of the Airbus systems. The systems monitor hundreds and hundreds of sensors, and uh, you know they can be affected by uh, you know such mundane things as a little bit of uh, frost or ice on a sensor can can uh, can cause it to pre present bad data. There is no direct warning to show if the fuel level is falling faster than the engines are consuming it. So the pilots receive no immediate indication that there could be a fuel leak. The fuel quantity isn't rising in the tanks for the right wing. Check fuel quantity. Looks very low, hold on. When co-pilot de Jager carries out the fuel calculations, he discovers something is seriously wrong. It's much less fuel than we should have. It looks like a fuel leak. Check again. De Jager finds a disturbing difference. According to the, all the gauges, all the tanks in the right wing are way below the level they should be according to the flight plan, and, and there's hardly anything in the other ones. What about a trim tank? There's nothing there either. Yes? Hello, first officer here. Can you come to the cockpit, please? Sure. Although Captain Pichet still believes he is dealing with a computer problem, he nevertheless decides to ask for a visual check just in case to see if there could be a fuel leak. Captain? Hi. Can you and Karen uh, take some flashlights and go to the windows if you can see anything trailing back from the wings? It'll look like a mist or a stream and report back immediately. Okay. Great. I want you to do another complete fuel check, please. I'm so sorry. In daylight, the fuel pouring out the back of the wing would have been clearly visible. But in the dead of night, even with a torch, the fuel leaking from the engine is impossible to see. evidently realized that the situation was not improving. And uh, at that point, they realized that, there's, that their circumstances were becoming more serious. And uh, I think that there were probably some discussions took place between the two pilots as to what their next course of action should be. If the computer is correct, then with the amount of fuel remaining, the Airbus will no longer be able to make it to Lisbon. Captain Pichet is forced to die.